I, for one, want to start by saying I'm not an expert on the geopolitics and the relationship between Australians and Aboriginal Australia. Okay. I hope you don't have that expectation of me, but I'm going to try to create commentary and criticism about this architecture and architectural proposal from the, from the standpoint of a disinterested um, citizen of the world. And I'll probably, um, I'll do my best to only create criticisms that aren't, um, that are outside of that sphere of knowledge, which I believe I can do. And that um, I will only make, you know, I will make speculations. So I think that's important. I mean, I can put on, um, I can put on a lens of a formalist and just talk about the architecture and the building. Um, but this is a really, I think, important knot in the world, right? There's, an, there's important forces here that I'm trying to unravel a little bit. Um, and unraveling those might tell us a little bit about what this architecture is saying, right? And how it behaves, um, and and what it might be, who it might be in service to, really. And um, I, I think those are all important things. So let me begin with. I think it's quite, I mean, this is a very beautiful image, just on the surface. I mean, it's a, it's a gorgeous rendering. There's a lot of great material. The grass looks lush and tall and like natural, right? Um, there's a lot of people visiting. I, there, the sun is hitting the building at this beautiful angle making the some faces glow a warm hue while the cool evening um, colors start to uh, invade from the darker corners. Um, the, the detailing of the edge, the lower edge of this kind of plat raised platform is one of the first things that caught my eye, actually. Um, if you can see the uh, these this edge is like a is a razor sharp edge platform um, and I think that's a really beautiful detail that's you can have um, let's see if I can't just do like a nice you can have the glass come down and essentially that platform in section is going to be is going to have a point to it and but then get really really thick inside so like this is a person inside this is the the, the these are the columns this is the roof whatever that roof is doing um, but that that edge comes to a sharp point right and so what that does is that you know it tries to eliminate or disappear the edge and as a, you know, as a detail, I think that's really beautiful um, because it tries to disappear this, this platform. And you can see now underneath, right, you can see that there are, that there are, a tr there's a triangulation underneath. Can you see that? Um, or should I make the, this bigger? Um, There's a there's a slight triangulation a paneling paneling under that so they they're they clearly know that that's the the way like that slab is gonna have to thicken up but I do think it's kind of um, a nice joint okay the building let's let's get some so this is the Woods Bagot website so first of all. It's a collaborative effort, and it won a competition. 
and it's an international competition to design a museum, art and cultural center, right, at the that sits at the at the edge of you know at, between civilization and Aboriginal space. Or, um, and so I think that it's kind of strange that it's in a city, <laughs> but, um, let's go over a few more, um, details. So that's kind of what I see in this image, right? There's a lot to like. I mean, I, I actually, you know, the whole ground plane. Okay. You see it. Um, there's a lot to like about the building. There's a few things I really am on comfortable with or I'm almost a little a little like eh could have been better um and we're going to get into that and and but I I want to discover a little bit more about its context before I understand how to speak on those uh design ideas because for the rest of these design the, the, I mean these are some very very uh, difficult or or wild decisions to make. So wh why why were those decisions made, right? Um, grounded on Korna Korna land, the design narrative. So first of all, offer extraordinary immersive experiences combining traditional storytelling with modern technology, celebrating sixty five thousand years of Aboriginal cultures, and creating a global tourism attraction. Okay. As a gateway to the oldest living cultures in the world by incorporating elements of earth, land, and sky. Ah, earth, land, and sky. Okay. So it's, first of all, it's on native, it's on native land. Um, 11,500 square meters. It's very large, of course. Um, Adelaide, Australia is based on the deep aboriginal connection to the country to country place and kin with connected layers being the foundation of the design connected layers look um reading architects websites is really difficult um the uh, you know what's funny about a site like woods Baggett website or a nbbj website the designers who work on the project don't write what's on the website that's pretty crazy. They have a department. There is a there is a department of um, in 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 large architecture firms and offices. There is a there's an advertising department, which handles the you know the um, the press the the wording on the website. Um. Arky speak, yeah. <laughs> so lower level galleries and terrace landscapes are carved from the earth, providing indoor exhibition spaces, performance space, and gathering area for welcome to country ceremonies within the outdoor amphitheater. Reveals in the upper galleries, frame views oriented to the sky, Natural surroundings, yes, 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 while also exposing the activity within, depicting truth telling and transparency. Whoa, reorient the building to King Kuvalaya, Adelaide Botanical Garden. All right. Here we go. There's a PR department. Yes. The truth telling happens in this building. Um, one of the one of the things I'll react to immediately that's concerning is and this is just design, this is just design concern. Do you guys see the like, um, see these? 
like trellis structure that's oriented really do you see that i don't like that the i don't like that i don't know what that is yet but it looks like a kind of trellis roof on the interior of the donut that is th those are way too long to be glass panels so it's not it's 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 definitely um empty but where like they move they're moving from the outer ring or the the i guess the inner ring of the donut the up upper side of the inner ring of the donut and they move down towards the inside of the tree and they don't end and they look like 10 meters or so at least that's invisible range that in the in the visibility of this so i don't know i i, I realize um you know we basically have like three images to go on which is like a little bit like I know that they're going to they have time to figure that detail out and I I understand the architecture process um and how you know that'll that'll change but there's something disconcerting about that because it seems so far fetched and un and and not like I, I don't know what that would gain you, even if it was built, but it, it seems like a throwaway like two second idea to sort of fill something in there and then um gosh but that's the kind of thing that happens in um large practices, maybe. I don't know. This is this is a, there's a lot of different hands in the pot for this. So hang on before we go too over the overboard with any of this. Let's look at the Diller's video and rent for a website. Well, actually, you know what's really you know what's really telling? Woods Bagot collaborated with Diller's video and Renfro. There's nothing taught. There's nothing about collaborations with local communities or with Aboriginal architecture um, or discussions with them on the Woods Bagot website. They're touting their. We partnered with Diller Scafidio and Renfro. Now, they do mention some of the uh, formal moves are are invested or are about the relationship to some aboriginal structures we're just not there yet um in the story we're building okay we're not there yet but it is kind of strange that that's who they would declare as their partner in collaboration with woods bagot the aboriginal art center's new paradigm that showcases the past present and future of aboriginal cultures while supporting contemporary art practices and events across disciplines. Okay. I mean, look, this is a condenser, right? It's a cultural condenser. It sounds, um, uh, it's, it's an interesting project. Like I'm interested in this project and I think we, um, you know, we do have to ask ourselves as architects, you know, like, Uh, and something I challenge my students with all the time or challenge my studios is, you know, we have to be asked to design for other cultures always. It's, it's not, it's, it's, it's tough that like a very white, very New York firm is designing this structure in a faraway country for, you know, between Aboriginal people and um, Australia, right? They are involving a local firm of Woods Bagot, which is a humongous office. But that part, I, th I think there's two parts to this one. One, 
is that all architects should be should be in school prepared to understand that you are going to design spaces for cultures, people, and um, constituencies of which you may not be a part. And that's okay. We need better training on how to do that. On, on We need to learn in school that we're not designing because we're not in school to become an architect to put our signature buildings in someone else's neighborhood. We're in school to ar as architects to learn how to honor and um, make space for other cultures that make sense for them and are also beautiful. And I think that relationship can be beneficial and, and still be amazing and interesting architecture. B, or two, <laughs> this particular situation to me, I think is an example where that becomes, that that paradigm becomes like a very critiquable paradigm because you've got a, you know, an A-lister New York architecture firm trying to bring about this piece of architecture. And I don't know how um, authentically they can engage this space or this place, right? Um, without doing a kind of a deep, a deep dive or deep engagement. And at least as far as I've seen, there, there wasn't one. They won a competition with a jury, which had one member of an Aboriginal uh, art community um, guide, and then like nine other people. And we're going to get into that in a second. But like, I do think the you know the the best architects in the world should be should be able to take on projects that are rife with cultural clashes right um that's part of what we should be trained to deal with especially moving forward i don't know it makes it really difficult to judge um in form because I can't know what, what a, a different result would look like. However, I can judge based on the information available to me that's being sold to me as a good architecture and call that into question as a design process, right? That I can do because that we have access to as critics um, and as fellow architects, we have access to this material. We do not have access to you know, the wishes and um, dreams and spaces of Aboriginal Australia versus the, you know, geopolitical situation of Adelaide. Um, but we do have access to um, the media and portrayal of architecture as device. Yeah, my friends, that's important. Wow. This is chill. Okay, so they won a competition. Here's the jury. Um, and look, it, here's a question too. Does the jury need to be made of you know, uh, a, a good jury should be able to toss toss this out. There's uh, plenty of it's a very diverse jury of people from all over the world, all over the place with a lot of experience in art um, and architecture. Uh, some people who I know, some people who I don't know, but um, there's certain, certainly a lot of people with a lot of experience here. And um, at least one outright uh, Aboriginal voice, but on a panel of, you know, 10, 10 people. But I, I, I haven't read every single bio. So I'm I'm certain they put together like a pretty qualified jury to just like pick an architect that wins it. Um but 
let's talk about like what the 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 thing is like what is the goal here that's really what we need to know in order to think that you know to critique this and and chat exactly right um welcome arrivals is the kind of goal and i don't know Welcome arrivals is is a is it it doesn't sit right it doesn't feel right because here's this link for um Humpty Humpy excuse me <laughs> Humpy Whirly or Humpy a temporary shelters used by Aboriginal Australians I have a I have, I have a serious question. They link this research. What the fuck <laughs> is, do you need to use a temporary shelter for? As an excuse to spend, what's the total? You know what? I did see the, I did see the, the, um, Budget. I I thought I saw a budget somewhere. Competition bid. I swear I saw the budget. I don't know, but it's probably a lot. Right? Of course you, you know, what the fuck do you need to use humpies as an excuse to put, you know, to, 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 to get, um, to charge a whole bunch of money for these things. Like, it seems like, it, it feels appropriative, um, in that, the first thing you would try to do with architecture is to make things that look like tents, right? Things that look like Aboriginal structures. And being inspired by, to me, is like, um, there's a, there's a real problem. And, um, in, in the book about uh, African-American architecture, there's um, the problem with African-American museums in Dark Space uh, by Mario Gooden. It talk, talks about how just, you know, um, it became a problem because, you know, African symbols and shapes and forms were just abstracted and made into the shape and form of the building and that there was something there there you, you and I we know as architects that there's something transformative about spatial relationships and organization of a building that could have a lot more to do with with a culture and their experiences and their way of life than what the the thing looks like right than this than the the symbols of the culture that being said i understand why people right need or you know understand like people associate images with with images but like i'm like oh okay so here's this here's this humpy And I can't say I read the, I read through this, but I'm here to look at the research. And here I see okay, people have built things based on this before. If you can't see that, it looks interesting. It looks shaped. Oh, thank you, chat. The budget is like two hundred million AUD.
Oh yeah. Um, here's another one. I mean, this. Okay, first of all, it's this is pretty gorgeous. Um, I don't know that I care. I don't know that I care what it's based on. This is pretty like hardcore. Um, this does not look that welcoming. But apparently people have been building, you know, people have been, um, 155 million USD for the budget. Okay. Look at this. Here we go, everybody. Images given to Ian used as reference for Humpy. Yeah. This is some um, some District 9 shit. Like temporary structures used by aboriginals on, on maybe on reservations or something. Um, but it's a nomadic space, right? <laughs> I don't know what this is. Um, Kunsthaus draws. Okay, let's let's get beyond this. These are some pictures of of humpies, and I, th I this this photo is particularly jarring because the um, humpies are supposed to be temporary spaces, and here's this thing. So, according to Let's kind of um, let's keep going here. According to somebody who 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 messaged me who worked at Woods Bagot before, but does not currently, this is supposed to be like a box opening or closing in that like mid mid zone, um, where all the flaps are kind of intertwined. Um, but it could also be thought of as like pack up and leave, right? Um, so what's the take? It always, all of these reviews, we gotta like, we gotta build up our knowledge by kind of looking at some details, looking up some numbers, talking, you know, talking about some ideas like Aboriginal space, um, art what their goals are here what the where you know what's the site what's it look like this is adelaide wow i'm sure it's going to be a very um i'm sure it's going to be a very important site here's of course the a golf course at the center of the town um very interesting, actually, city layout. Very, um, it looks a little bit like uh, Georgia. Um, <laughs> why can't I think of a, yeah, anyway. I don't know what, I don't know what, all these spaces are Savannah. Thank you. Yes, Savannah. Okay, so it's supposedly the site for this thing is like right here. One of these botanical gardens. And like I said, I don't I don't know the the, the um the geopolitics of uh, Adelaide and much about it so it's it's hard to to even talk about this project as an urban uh project but i have to wonder you know like it i would i would really be interested um like 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 qu like questions around this piece of architecture involve also like what um if they're expecting that influx of viewers or of 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 world um travelers right what people have to think about who might be watching this who aren't architects um 
or architects as well. But the like the bounds of the uh, the bounds of criticism of a project also have to start to leak into the urban conditions, of course, and the and the and the um the conditions of what the project how the project is going to then shape the city around it. So, for example, um, and and why would we talk about that? Because I think the the project, the architect in charge of this project, could take up some extra territory in when it comes to some problematic issues that could arise and that the the um the 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 architect needs to uh be involved with uh discussions about and if they're not um if they if they just say i'm here to design a beautiful building and leave they, they're the they're the person or the entity that supposedly has the most power to kind of work a project so that it answers these kinds of questions. Questions like, what is going to happen with the airport infrastructure? What hotels will um, benefit from, who owns the hotels that will benefit from the increase in traffic? Who is going to come visit this? What, um, what are they going to take away from this visit? Why are they, you know, are they on vacation when they're coming to visit this? What does that, um, what does being, you know, what does people on vacation visiting a cultural object mean for um, the, for, for people's ability to retain that cultural information? What I mean by that is when we go on, you know, when we're on like vacation, do we want to, when we learn about cultures when we're on vacation, it is automatically kind of othered to us. It means that culture is um, is something outside of of our norm, our world, right? Anyway, um, we go on vacation to experience something different, right? I don't know. In a, in other words, uh, but 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 to put it very bluntly, the the status and condition of a visitor to this museum um, if they're expecting this increase in uh, in tourism where are they coming from where's their money going how are they spending it what are they learning what are they what do they want to be here to do and experience how does this museum you know how can it impact and shift the the relations with aboriginal people is that its goal? Um, it's supposedly the goal, right? Welcomes visitors with a gentle slope of native landscape at North Terrace. See, it's so funny that we refer to both people and plants with the same <laughs> native landscape. I mean, like what? Um, of the earth, of the earth, Aboriginal versus native. Um, all right, let's talk about the building again. After that, after that, a little bit of ranting, a little bit of theory, a little bit of ideas. I'm, I, I would be very concerned with, more concerned with how this building and and institution might affect the urban conditions and think that its its agency might have might end like um the agency of the architect can't end at this at this border right it it happens out here in the hotels in the city around it in this in this space wherever wherever that is at the horizon right i find it a little a little um telling then why this project is an urban project right the site itself is for me the most crucial element of this uh project that signals its uh, probably it's um, 
it's geopolitical situation. It's it's in a it's, you know it's in an urban space. It's it's um, a tourist attraction, and I, I don't think there's anything wrong with a uh, a hope to get people to come visit a museum to to establish a connection. I mean, that is like a that is a way to you know bridge connections with people to like learn about cultures institutionalizing that idea uh, you know like wh what if you take 170 million dollars and create a uh, grants uh, to invite um people to make different types of food to open restaurants with different types of cuisine and culture all over the city right how what if you were to create you know scholarships and housing etc right um yes the bilbao effect is exactly the problem that happened in bilbao when the tourism for the building overran the system and architects need to be prepared need to be able to talk about these things um because that's um that's a role we can play in these conversations and I don't know what kind of conversations are going to go on after this. Um, okay. Is it just me or do you feel like they're never going to be able to pull off an, an, an entirely <laughs> floating um, under underside like this? I am like logistically concerned with this incredibly free and open ground. And what what seems telling to me is that this this project is all about the ground. First of all, it's all about the ground. Architects have been trying to free you know free the ground, creates this new level. And when it does it kind of wraps it in a box? Okay, I need like a telestrator. I need like a pen. Let me look more at this terrible sketch I'm making. So if this is if this is aboriginal land right it, the building is trying to like what not touch it as much as it can that seems to me to be like a a little bit of a a little bit of a like why bother <laughs> at that point <laughs> um I don't know if it looks I don't know if it's as welcoming as you as you'd think. But okay, this shell structure, I, I think for me, the issue I have with the project is it's too clean overall. It wants to be this like, like you see the, 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 you see what they were thinking. Oh, let's, let's build a bunch of humpies and we'll pick them up off the ground. And that creates a new ground, a new space and a new organization, a free and open underside, right? There, well, first of all, there's, there's, like Amazon, this isn't public space, right? There's going to be rules and laws and all that stuff. But more importantly, is that the relationship, like elevating the humpy, I'm probably saying that wrong, the humpy, the, the humpy, putting it on a pedestal, displaying it. I would prefer, I, I would prefer that museums showcase a kind of complicated history with any kind of Aboriginal symbol. If you are going to just literally recreate what's supposed to be inspired by, ab, you know, an Aboriginal form like a TP or a whatever. I don't see why there's there has to be such a hard line. I want some of these things to peel down all the way, the actual pieces, and this floor to create different different levels and different platforms. I think creating a kind of um, universal ground or like full ground is 
it re it it sort of starts to organize like it it try to me it's like suggesting that these are like totally um to like uh repaired and healthy relationships between you know uh the people who used to own or lived on or owned land and the colonizers right and i i think that it would be better if this looming heavy exactly shapes instead showcased the fraught histories of uh the relationship between you know aboriginal space and spaces of whiteness or spaces of colonial uh, the colonialists by by being a little more brutal um tearing this apart a little bit and um breaking it up not trying to be so universal good um with the ground plane and trying to trying to showcase a little more of the difficulty a little bit more of the fraught relationship and then maybe that then maybe then you know the experience wouldn't be so happy go lucky but would would begin to speak to uh the work the amount of work that needs to be done to um continue to um rectify uh the kind of relationships that uh colonialism has 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 um has had on on communities like this and like the same reason why we're uh going around putting turtles in heated spaces in Texas right now and that a, a lot has to be done. Okay. I wish I do wish this project all the best in the world. I want it to succeed in its in its well, maybe I don't want it to succeed in its mission. Most important collection of Aboriginal cultural material in the world and internationally renowned. Great. Oh, great! Yes, it holds Aboriginal art and culture. Great! It's a it's a it's a holding place. I mean, first of all, okay. This is if you're going to create, if you're going to like gather up and and display Aboriginal art and culture. Um, I agree. You'd better display all of it, and it better be free and open to the public. If you've got it, like, what do you do with it at this point? Either if you can't give it back, which you should probably, is to it better be on display. But it is about tourism. So anyway, maybe I. Maybe I hope the I hope the architecture the best, um, and I uh, oh hi, <laughs> and uh, there we go, and I hope the building resolves itself a little bit better. This like carbon fiber, um, weird twisted baskety thing. I I I think a hard edge on that on that. Uh, second level is is a little bit of a design mistake um, because it's too it's too sharp on the bottom it's it like all of those aboriginal uh, structures were very tethered to the ground or they I mean I know that they were like temporary but they were they went all the way to the ground they engaged it the ground was safe and warm and the ground was particularly not uncovered and open because it's a shelter so to try to take that shape and to lift it up and to you know um, make it do you know make it actually house and uh <laughs> house the stolen artifacts of its history uh it's a little weird it's like uh the building is a pelt See, I always get the best ideas right when I'm about to finish. Um, 
that's what she said. The building itself is a pelt of a, you know, a, a, a murdered and conquered Aboriginal culture, uh, uh, pierced, cut, and displayed, right? Um, lifted into the air and displayed for all to see and housing now the stolen and conquered art of those the cultures. So, um, hot take. There it is. With without, I mean, they really need. It's a basket case. No, they really, they could have probably worked in a more. Like there are designers, there's people studying these things who can help that are making good work. I think what happens is if if any of these um if anybody like Woods Baggett or or Diller Scafidi and Renfro is hiring or at or talking to somebody who specializes in this kind of architectural relationship, they're not taking they're not they're they're crafting the architecture to more of their own vision rather than listening to those people, possibly, if they're involved, which is unclear. Um, but you should be. They should be. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. It's been real. I think that uh, YouTube is the perfect place for... Um, uh, criticism to be happening of architecture that can reach a wider audience and I'm trying to um, work on my abilities to speak to these conditions with clarity um, and conviction so hell yeah guys thank you so much for being here